So Mark chapter 8, while you're turning there, let me just uh, begin by saying, you know, sometimes married couples wake up to the realization that despite a number of years that they've been married, they're really not all that close to each other. Perhaps they may have made a big mistake. They built their lives around their kids or they pursued their own interests and haven't paid a whole lot of attention to the interest of their spouses. I use that illustration to say this. We who are believers always need to beware of how close we really are to the Lord. I sometimes think that we may think that we're closer to the Lord than we really are. So I want to begin with that question. I want to plant that in your mind to think about. Are you close to God? The chapter of Mark 8 begins by giving us a real revelation of Jesus' compassion and his control of the whole situation. So if you got Mark 8, I just want to read to begin. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto him, I have compassion on the multitude because they've been with me three days and they have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they'll faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. Very clearly, this reveals to us, Jesus cares about people. He has compassion. Very simply, he has compassion on people. And when we read how he deals with this situation of hungry people by the thousands, we also recognize he has complete control of every situation. And here in the first nine verses, his compassion and his control of this uh, Circumstance really centers in the fact that he gives provision. The first nine verses are about provision. And it's apparent from this account of the feeding of not the 5,000, this is a second uh, feeding of the 4,000. And by the way, when those numbers are given, that only applies to the men that were in the congregation there. There were 4,000 men. That doesn't count their wives or their children, which, of course, would have made it a much larger crowd. But here's, it's apparent from this account of the feeding of the 4,000 that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. And he has the ability to do whatever he determines to do. Provision. There's a second... Uh, matter that I want you to see in verses 14 to 16. This is uh, after the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, they get into a boat, he and the disciples, and they're going to another location. And uh, while they are going to that location, Jesus says, picking up in verse 14 uh, or 15, he charged him, he said, take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, of the leaven of Herod. Verse 16, and they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Perceive you not yet? Don't you understand yet? Have uh, ye... Your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? Don't you remember when I break, when I, I, I break the five loaves among 5,000? How many baskets full of fragments took you up? They said 12. And when I just, when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said seven. And by the way, the seven baskets that they took up, I mean, they were big enough for a man to get in. It's 
big baskets. And then he says uh, to them in verse 21, how is it that you do not understand? So here's a second thing I want you to see in Mark chapter 8. We see Jesus' provision in the feeding of the 4,000, first nine verses. But here in verses 14 to 26, we see the disciples' confusion. We see their confusion. They're mixed up. And they are mixed up about very important spiritual truth. Yeah, that's the way we are. We're not unlike them. And they are exposed as being confused in these verses that I've just taken the time to read. The 12 disciples were foolishly worried about bread, about physical provision, that they just saw the Lord do something spectacular, miraculous, in the feeding of thousands of people from just seven loaves of bread. And they're worried about physical provision, and Jesus basically uh, shows that they are, <laughs> they're spiritually blind and deaf to spiritual truth. See that in verse 18? You have eyes you don't see, you have ears you don't hear. Your memory, you got a memory lapse too. You got amnesia, you don't remember. Don't you remember? He's talking about their, they lack here, basically this, they lack the spiritual capacity to grasp what Jesus was all about. The miracles that they witnessed didn't have much effect upon them, at least not a lasting effect upon them, uh, because he says you're full of blindness, and by blindness he means unbelief. You're full of blindness. And then... He illustrates. I think he's illustrating because this is strange. The healing of the blind man, beginning in verse 22, down through verse 26, look at it. Let's, let's read it. He comes to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and he besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw aught, if he saw correctly. And he looked up and he said, I, I see men walking as trees. I see men as trees walking. I, men look like trees walking. Verse 25, after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. He didn't see trees walking around like men. This time he was restored and he saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it uh, to any in the town. I believe that their confusion is exposed in verses 14 to 21. That is the, the confusion of the 12 disciples. And I think in the, heal, the way Jesus worked in healing this blind man, he is, their, their confusion is illustrated. He just accused them of being blind. And now he takes this blind man, this physically blind man, and I believe uses it, uses him as an illustration of the blindness that his own disciples possessed spiritually. Jesus initially opens this blind man's eyes, but still with his open eyes, he's not able to see clearly. So with the disciples, their eyes had been opened to a degree, but they still really didn't get it. It wasn't clear to them who Jesus really was and what he was doing and what his mission was. They were like that man that was, that was blind, that was partially healed. They were confused. They didn't see clearly spiritually. He was bringing their spiritual blindness to no longer exist. And then the rest of the chapter, which is verses 27 to 38, I think that this is really where he deals and breaks through their confusion, at least attempts to, 
because he talks here about his mission. Okay? There's provision, first nine verses, confusion in uh, verses 14 to 26 on the part of the 12, and then Jesus begins to open up to them and try to reveal and remove their blindness by talking about his mission in the rest of the chapter, 27, verse 27 to 38. Jesus wanted them to realize and we, not, we need to realize this, too, that he was here on this earth on a mission. And he wanted those 12 disciples to get fully on board with him. He wanted them to be part and thus co-mission with him. We talk about the great co-mission. Well, it's Jesus' mission that he invites his disciples to come alongside with him. Well... Before we look at Jesus' mission, he has, to, he has to have them clearly understand his identity. I mean, what good is it if he gives his strategy if they don't understand his identity? And so that's exactly what he does when he takes them there to Caesarea Philippi in verse 27. And he asks that, that significant question, whom do men say that I am? He wants them to understand his identity because that's important. If they're ever going to grasp the mission that he's on, they have to know really who he is. To join in his mission, the 12 have to accurately identify who Jesus is because he's their leader. What you believe about Jesus or why you believe in Jesus like them, is just vitally important. It's through Jesus' words, it's through Jesus' works that we get every indication of who he is. And yet the 12, they were with him all this time and they didn't get it. You know what that tells me? We could read our Bibles. We can be faithful in church attendance and not really get who Jesus is, not really understand his true identity, or, or the, uh, just uh, Peter is asked, and Peter answers, he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says in verse 29, thou art the Messiah. And you know, Jesus uh, commends him in the Matthew account, and says, Peter, you're blessed because you didn't come up with that on your own. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My identity was given to you as a revelation from the Heavenly Father. His identity. Peter said, you're the Messiah. And Peter only knew that because from what Jesus said in Matthew 16, he got a direct revelation from God, or he would not have said that. Now Jesus turns from revealing his identity to revealing his strategy for this mission. Okay, I'm the Messiah. What do you think the, what do you think the mission of Messiah is? Oh, it's to free Israel from all of their evil enemies, right? That's the way they thought. That's the way humans think. That's human thinking. Physical deliverance, first and foremost. He's going to talk about his strategy, and it is going to what, it's just going to be so counterintuitive to human thinking. Just totally not what they would be thinking the mission of the Messiah is. What's his strategy? He starts revealing it. Jesus shares a very important secret with uh, the 12. Notice what he says, verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man, and by the way, Son of Man it does not emphasize the humanity of Jesus. It actually emphasizes the deity of Jesus. It's a misnomer to think that Son of God means deity and Son of Man means humanity. Uh-uh. Son of Man, you can trace it back to Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Son of Man is the visible Yahweh, the visible God of the Jewish people. 
son of man. And so he says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. What? That's not the mission of Messiah, the way I think of it. And be raised three days later, rise again. So <laughs> he shares a secret with the twelve. And that secret is simply this. He's openly, with the twelve disciples, instructing them about the necessity of the crucifixion and resurrection. And the secret is this. They never would have figured this out, and you and I wouldn't either. Death leads to life. And suffering leads to glory. Death to resurrection. Resurrection, enthronement. That's the secret that he's sharing with them. Of course, they don't get it at this point. I wouldn't either. But he's revealing his strategy for the mission. And look at what the response is. Remember, Peter just got a direct revelation from God. You're the Messiah! And got commended for that, that uh, he let God speak to him. Now, look at Peter again. Verse 32, and he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Whoa. Rebuking. Because Peter, I think, stands for all 12 disciples, and folks, they were absolutely stunned by what Jesus just shared with them as to his mission and the strategy of his mission as Messiah going to be crucified. And so Peter, he's expressing his feelings about it by rebuking the Lord. By the way, that word uh, rebuke in verse 32 is exactly the same word in the original language that Jesus used to rebuke demons. That's the word Peter used to rebuke the Lord. Now, Peter loved Jesus. <laughs> However, through Peter's rejection of God's revealed will for the Messiah or God's revealed method to accomplish what Messiah came to accomplish, he put himself in a very wrong position before the Lord. Peter did so because he was ignorant of that connection between death and life, between suffering and glory. And Jesus, his response made it very clear that if you shun God's method, if you resist the way that God works, you become a great stumbling block to the Lord. Look at what Jesus says. Verse uh, uh, 33, and when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. You're a stumbling block if you resist the method and will of God. You're a great stumbling block to the Lord. Look at what Jesus is saying to Peter. Basically, Jesus is, he's rebuking now. <laughs> Peter rebuked Jesus, now Jesus is rebuking Peter, and in essence rebuking all the twelve. But what Jesus says in that 33rd verse is that I distance myself from any believer, any disciple that tries to sidestep God's will by interpreting what I say or what the Bible says from a human viewpoint in order to avoid any kind of suffering or unpleasant circumstances or difficulties or sacrificial living for the Lord. I'll distance myself from them. That's what Jesus said. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're a hindrance in the path, in the, in the direction God's going. You're in the way. You're a roadblock. Get behind me. Get a distance away from me. 
When I thought about that, that really struck me. That Jesus, and this is, the, this is the thought that came to me, Jesus distances himself from believers that try to sidestep God's will. That interpret the Bible from a human viewpoint. That's what he's accusing Peter of doing there in verse 33. You're seeing this whole thing from a human viewpoint and not from God's viewpoint. And yet God just revealed to you who I am, but you're resisting God's method and God's will regarding what I, the Messiah, am here to accomplish. And so I distance myself from you. Get behind me. Get out of my way. Stop resisting what God has sent me here to do. So, have you ever heard this? If you don't feel as close to God as you once did, who moved? You say, oh, obviously I did. No, maybe Jesus moved. Maybe he distanced himself from you because of a human thinking regarding spiritual truth, thing, uh, something that you know that God spoke in the Scripture, but you are resisting it. You, Jesus distanced himself, I believe, in fellowship from his own people. So, how close are you to the Lord? You know, <laughs> there is a price to be paid for closeness to Jesus, if you genuinely want to be close to Jesus, it's going to cost you. And you know what the price tag is on it? You ready? Absolute surrender. The absolute surrender of yourself to God is the price tag for closeness to Jesus. And so I would say that any believer is just as close to the Lord as they want to be. Well, look at the resulting uh, things that come from this, beginning in verse 34. When he called uh, the people unto him with his disciples, he said, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He's talking to believers to followers when he says this. And the problem is more than a theological problem. That is, the messianic expectations that the 12 disciples and many Jewish people had in that day and even in our day. The uh, problem is a, has a practical outcome. And that is, followers of Jesus face a cross. They face suffering. Satan's philosophy and human philosophy is that you can have glory without suffering. That is absolutely unbiblical. There's no glory without suffering. Fact of the matter is, God transformed your suffering into glory. That's the truth of what he's saying here. So your philosophy really impacts your life as a believer and your service for the Lord. Now, I want to concentrate on that 34th verse, what Jesus said. There's really three things here, three things that uh, explain what he meant when he told Peter, you're thinking like a man and not like God. Here's God's requirement, you might say, for disciples. The first one, Jesus knew that the majority of the followers were following him for the miracles that he performed, uh, for the bread that he would feed them. They were unwilling to pay the price of real discipleship. So he gets real clear here in that 34th verse. And basically he says this, if you are going to be my true follower, it's going to demand that you, notice this, deny himself. See that? those two words, deny himself in verse 34? That's what I meant when I said absolute <laughs> surrender. 
That is, you lose your life. That's what he's talking about in verse 35. You lose your life by handing yourself completely over to God. He's not talking about denying yourself like, uh, like Catholics do during the month of Lent, where they're, they're not going to drink coffee for that month, or they're not going to eat sweets. For it. It's not self-denial. When he says, uh, let a man deny himself, he's not talking about self-denial, but he's talking about a once-for-all, total, absolute surrender of your life to God where you hand yourself over, that's what it means to deny yourself. That, Lord, I'm not my own, and I'm handing myself over to you. I have no right to myself. First of all, I didn't make myself. You're my creator. I belong to you. And secondly, I wandered in sin away from you, and so you redeemed me by your life, your blood, and so I belong to you on the basis of redemption two times over. I don't belong to myself, so I absolutely surrender myself to you. And then he says in that 34th verse, let him deny himself. Secondly, take up his cross. That is simply a daily identification with the crucified Christ. Remember how Paul put it? He says, I am crucified with Christ. I am. <laughs> Present tense. It never ends. I am crucified with Christ. <sighs> Brings out your own unique individual opportunity of saying no to your self-life in order for Christ to live out his life in and through you. That's what it means to take up your cross and follow him. You know, people say, oh, you know, I, I have uh, a certain disease. It's just the cross I have to bear. That is not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about whatever you have to say no to, to yourself, in order to walk with the Lord, in order to serve the Lord. And there are things that we have to daily say no to. No, I can't do that. No, I can't have that attitude. No, I can't go to that place. No, I can't work there. No, we have to say no in order to say yes to the Lord. That's what it means to take up your cross, to daily identify with the crucified Christ, to say no to your self-life, in order to live the Christ life, and that is him in you and through you. And then thirdly, he says, and follow me. That is simple obedience. To follow him is obedience. That means, God, I'm not in charge. I've denied myself. I'm not going to say what I'm going to do and not going to do. I'm going to go anywhere you want me to go. And I am going to do anything you want me to do. And I'm going to do it anytime you want me to do it. That's what it means to follow in obedience. No self-will, only his will. Now, that's pretty stringent, wouldn't you say? But that also determines just how close you are to Jesus. Because if this doesn't matter to you, you're not close to Jesus, no matter what you think. If this matters to you, then, you know, when we would, as kids, play that game, oh, yeah, you're getting warm, you're getting warm, yeah, you're hot. When they're trying to find something, well, more that these things become reality in your daily life, you're, you're getting warmer you're getting hot, you're getting to the place where you're really getting close to the Lord, His heart. I remember back, because I was a teenager, back in the late 60s and early 70s, many people were, they were going, turning to drugs, LSD, um, Eastern religions, uh, they, they would use this excuse, they would say, I just gotta go and find myself. <laughs> Well, they found themselves all right. 
They might have been sincere. Some of them, I think, were certainly sincere in what they said, but others were just using it as an excuse to do what they felt like doing. You know the way to find yourself? <laughs> he says it in verse 35, by losing yourself. You find yourself by losing yourself. If you live for yourself, you will guarantee it, lose yourself. But if you live for Jesus and the gospel, you will find yourself. And Christian life is, you might say, a matter of profit and loss. It's a question of whether you waste your life or you invest your life. Whether you make it count for time and eternity or... Not at all. Lose your own soul is what he says there in that uh, verse um, 36. To lose your own soul, that's simply a wasted life. That doesn't mean you go to hell. That means you wasted your life. And you know, life is precious, right? And it's short, really. It's short. I'm finding that out. Life is short and it's precious. And you lose your life, you can waste it by missing opportunities to make your life count. And you know what? If you waste your life, you can't get it back. You can't get it back. But I've heard of people that have surrendered to go to a foreign mission field after they retired and, and spent 20 or 30 years even on a foreign field serving the Lord. They were trying to invest their life that they had wasted prior to that. But anyway... That's why life is really a life of faith. It's just simple trust and dependence upon the Lord. I spoke with someone recently on the phone that I hadn't spoken to in years. This fellow is a, a good friend of mine, really loved the Lord. He and I, we, we were both training for ministry back long ago. And, you know, he ended up that he never got in the ministry. He ended up taking a job, did good, you know, made some good money, smart, just could do about anything, never made it in the ministry. Hadn't heard from him for, oh, I don't know, shall I say 15 years? Called me up last week. And one of the things he said when he, when he hung up, he said, you know, Jim, he said, I just come to the conclusion he's a year older than me. I've come to the conclusion that I made some wrong choices and I regret now because I feel like I've wasted the bulk of my life. And he said, I'm so glad that you didn't. I'm so glad that you followed what you said God called you to do. I felt so bad for him. I wanted to give him something to comfort him, but I couldn't because he was, he was right. He wasted his life. He didn't invest it. When you back away from the will of God because you don't want to pay the price, Jesus distances himself from you as far as fellowship. And you'll not sense your closeness to him until you submit. And so really the choice is up to you.